Welcome to the State Secrets Podcast brought to you by the Cypher Brief. I'm Cypher Brief publisher Suzanne Kelly. My co-host, Cypher Brief COO Brad Christian, and I set out with this podcast to bring you the most engaging conversations on national security with true experts who understand the issues from multiple perspectives. The State Secrets Podcast is part of a series of podcasts produced by the Cypher Brief. Hello and welcome. My co-host, Brad Christian, is off today. The big news in the national security world is that the once annual worldwide threats hearings are back in Washington this week, with the intelligence community's top leaders testifying before both the House and the Senate on their assessment of the greatest threats to U.S. national security. The public hearings did not take place last year after political differences over whether they should be held in a public forum. You might remember in earlier years, then President Trump did not agree with key findings of the IC though the hearings are not intended to agree with any president's agenda, but are intended to shed light on how the different agencies view and rank today's threats. Appearing before the committees this week are Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, CIA Director Bill Burns, NSA Director General Paul Nakasone, FBI Director Christopher Wray, and Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Scott Barrier. And joining me today is someone who has sat in one of those chairs during his time as acting director of the CIA. John McLaughlin is not only former acting director of CIA, he also served as deputy director of the agency for four years. And he joined the agency after serving as an army officer. John is now the distinguished practitioner in residence at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And I'm very proud to say as a cipher brief expert, John, welcome. Hey, thanks, Suzanne. Good to be with you. I want to talk about the issues that are likely to come up um, during this week's hearings, but let's unpack the hearings themselves for just a moment. The worldwide threat assessment is a combination of sort of the intelligence findings from across the 17 agencies. Is that right? Yes. And if you could just kind of shed some light on how this all comes together for us and why this particular report that is generated is so important. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's been a, an annual report for, I'm going to guess, maybe 15 years. Uh, it wasn't always given. If you went back to my very first days at CIA, I don't recall this being done. I think it was maybe a casual uh, testimony done by the director of CIA back then. But I, I would say more than a decade ago, it became a kind of annual ritual, and it's, it's embedded in, in congressional directives to the intelligence community that this be done. So uh, how does it come together? Well, uh, let me say this first. The intelligence community actually takes this very seriously. Even though this is an unclassified open hearing, there is a classified closed hearing that goes with it, but leave that aside for a moment. The important thing is the unclassified hearing. They take it very seriously because they realize they're speaking to the record. And given that the mission of intelligence is to keep you from, a, from experiencing surprise and to warn you about things that are coming of concern, they realize that if, if they don't cover those things and something happens, they will be noted as having missed it. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect to it. And you weigh the words you put in here for, from that point of view, and also from the standpoint of what I'm saying, is it really unclassified? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just remember struggling with the actual phrasing of this right up until the night before, you know, 11 o'clock, an analyst would call me and say, I don't think we've got the right formulation on Iran, for example. And we would play with it right up to the last minute and driving in the car to the hill. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, uh, what you say then becomes, it's noteworthy on several, several levels. First, Congress likes this because one thing I've learned about senators and representatives, as interested as they are in intelligence, and as much as they want to be on the secret committees, they really want something they can say publicly, yeah. because that's what they do. And so they value it on two levels. First, these are things they can then say publicly about these issues. And second, it does deepen their understanding of the issues and the priority that's being assigned to those issues by the people who spend their entire days working exclusively on China or Russia or whatever. Now, there's, a, there's, a, there's another school of thought here. 
which is maybe it's a bad idea to do this because other countries don't do this mm-hmm. and do it publicly and not publicly mm-hmm. and and therefore your adversaries can study this given what i've just said that we take it seriously and at least glean a sense of what our priorities are and what our our kind of bottom line thinking is on the level of threat or concern that they present mm-hmm. you know whether our concern is centered on missiles or biological weapons or regional uh, trouble they're causing or whatever they can, they can hear that um, you balance that against the fact that american intelligence lives in the most open transparent society in the world and therefore there's value to the transparency given the controversy about intelligence usually and the mystery of it um, and so the american people can see the people to whom they're giving these billions of dollars Mm-hmm. sitting there and saying here is what we think is important in the world at this moment there's there's value to that transparency but there have been times i think uh, james clapper when he was dni expressed some reservations about speaking publicly on these issues mm-hmm. he did it and did it very well but i think um, you can see that dichotomy in the views that you know on the one hand it's great to have this transparency and it informs the Congress, informs the American people, but it's also something that our adversaries can study for whatever hints they can glean from it. Yeah, I'm about sure right they do. I'm sure yes. they do. I, I know the world is watching. I know that um, this is a big event every year for uh, reporters and correspondents who cover. I was US gonna National say the, the media loves this too because it, it not only tells them what intelligence is thinking, but uh, putting myself in the shoes of a reporter, I would take leads from this. I would say, mm, that's interesting. Let's dig into that. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, that, that's, a, that's a plus and a minus. It uh, depends on your perspective. By and large, if you're wondering what I think, I think it's a good thing to do. You do. I think the, the positives of it outweigh the negatives. And frankly, I always look forward to doing it. I yeah. enjoy doing it. You brought up a really interesting thing too, which is uh, a, a key thing that we don't really, you know, us on the outside of the intelligence community don't really think about, but that whole fear of what are we missing, which I think really drives a lot of the intelligence work uh, that's done. Um, let me ask you though, you know, there's a there's an open session, and right. then there's a a closed session, which is where you know the classified uh, issues are discussed. I mean, without obviously asking you to talk about anything classified, like just so the general public kind of understands what is different about that classified session? I mean, it, you know, did they turn the lights down and you're in a dark shady room and all of a sudden the real stuff comes out? I mean, what is the difference, John, between the open and the classified sessions? Well, you do change rooms. So <laughs> okay. the, the open session is in a, a public hearing room. Yeah. And then you march over to a closed room, a, a very secure room that is uh, that mirrors basically the most secure facilities inside the CIA. That is, it is uh, protected against intercepted communications. It's uh, behind um, vaulted doors, uh, and you need a clearance to go in there. And so the senators and representatives march into one of those rooms. There are two of them, and you go in with them, and the atmosphere changes rather markedly really in, in the public session of course the, the senators and representatives are on television and they on the one hand they're conducting a serious series of questions but they're also performing for television so it's in the open session that you're likely to have the sparks fly over some political issue and it, it is virtually certain that whatever the controversy of the day is will be raised almost immediately in the open session regardless of what you as the intelligence officers say so for example next week uh bet on it that whatever they say probably the first questions are going to be about the january 6th insurrection and of course cia will not have a great deal to say about that because it doesn't operate in the united states that's the fbi's job so the director of national intelligence may make some overarching remarks because she has under her purview a portion of the FBI that focuses on a variety of things. But chances are Director Ray will handle those questions. 
but then there'll be questions about pandemic, I'm sure, because that's on everyone's mind. And in Dan Coates' testimony in 2019, which by the way, was the last time this was done, uh, 2019, very controversial testimony, yes. gotten you know into a battle with Trump over what they said. Yes. Uh, but uh, Coates did mention uh, about uh, halfway through that the United States remained vulnerable to the next, he called it flu epidemic, but and that's not far off from what we've experienced. Yeah. Uh, because I think the flu is a ver version of COVID, but he said basically we're vulnerable to the next uh, pandemic and it could generate uh, many deaths. So uh, some questions will almost immediately be about that. And then you can, well, so anyway, when you get to the closed session, uh, it's more somber and there's really almost no politics in it. And it's more directed to the substance of the issues, uh, keyed more to what the intelligence people have put on the table in that priority order. Yeah. And, uh, and of course involves classified information because the senators and congressmen are, are cleared for everything you know. So, so is that an environment where they can they can kind of drill down with you on yes. you know, how do you know this? Who yes. are your sources? Does it go yes. that far? Yes, they drill down. Uh, uh, how do you know this is a very common question. Yeah. What are your sources is a very common question. Now, on on that, you you don't literally give the names of human sources. You don't do that right. anywhere. Right. Uh, but uh, you certainly characterize your judgment says relying on mm -hmm. whatever it is, human sources, technical intelligence, intercepted messages, photographs from space, uh, special sensors, mm -hmm. whatever. And, and you usually will be asked, uh, how much confidence do you have in those sources? Mm -hmm. And you tend to think in terms of, I have high confidence or I have medium confidence or I have low confidence. You, so you talk about the level of confidence and the, uh, the access they have or don't have, the reporting records they have. You don't go, you don't spend an enormous amount of time on that, but that's fair game. And some senators will go there. I, I wonder what the risk is in that um, when you have a country that is as politically divided as the US has been um, over you know, the last several years. Um, is there ever some hesitation to trust in the senators as to how much you may tell them, depending on whoever's in office and, and what party is not. I wouldn't call it hesitation to trust, but what there is, what you do need in that setting is situational awareness. That is, you, you need to, under, the way I've always put it is, you are not political. You, here's the Especially dilemma. I see, yeah. Here's the dilemma. The least political part of the government, the intelligence community, comes face to face with the most political part of the government. Think about that. That's a great way to put it. And, and so you're in a political atmosphere, even though you are not political and you can't shade what you say yeah. to, to uh, play to the politics. But if you don't know how they're hearing you, you, you don't know how to pick your words. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand through what prism are they hearing this? And, and frankly, uh, in politics, intelligence is used as a weapon. Uh, that is, if you are in a political battle with your opponent and the intelligence community tells you something that strongly favors your side of an argument, the temptation is not so much to reveal classified information. In fact, I, I don't think many leaks of truly sensitive class, classified information come out of the Congress. I, I think they are pretty respectful of that responsibility. Mm -hmm. But uh, because it's emphasized so much, and and uh, well, I, that's that's my view, and yeah. but they will find a way to allude to the fact that they've heard things that strengthen their suspicion of such and such. They'll find a way to allude to the fact that they're aware of information that um, that the rest erodes, of us don't know. erodes the other side in some way. Yeah, good and, point. And so they're yeah they hear it that way. That, I mean, let's face it, they, they, <laughs> this is not critical, it's just observing reality. Uh, politics is a battle of sorts, and, and intelligence steps in there as this uh, clinical observer of the world, 
but you know you're going to say something that's going to favor one side or the other whether you want to or not but you have to be you have to be situationally aware so you don't fall into the trap of seeming to favor one side or the other yes and i can i can give you many examples over the years where someone didn't think and innocently said something i'll give you one example real quick yeah back in 1996 mm -hmm. we had produced a national intelligence estimate that said over the next 15 years there will not be a country other than Russia or China that develops an ICBM capable of hitting the United States. Oh, wow. Okay, we said that then. Uh, Senator Levin sent a letter to our congressional staff saying, where are you on this national estimate? We hadn't yet done it or published it or testified to Congress. Someone in congressional affairs very innocently wrote back a letter, just, you know, kind of Boy Scout-like, Boy Scout answer the question, well, we're going to say that there'll be no threat in the next 15 years. I think Levin went public with that uh -huh. because it was an unclassified letter. Yeah. And the Republicans who were very much in favor of uh, pushing uh, missile defense found that this uh, interpreted this as a, a political move by intelligence to undermine missile defense. It wasn't. It was just innocently naively answering a question yeah so if you're not aware of of who you're who you're speaking to and how they're going to use what you're telling them you can falsely give the impression that you are playing politics does that make sense it, it makes perfect sense and i think given today there's such a lack of context around some issues that if you just took a moment to get past the initial headline and understand context like that it would help all of us sort of um, know uh, what was really going on. Let me pause for just a moment. I'm pausing my conversation with former acting director and deputy director of the CIA, John McLaughlin, just for a moment to personally invite you to become a member of the Cypher Brief. Being a member gets you access to all of the Cypher Brief's national security focus virtual briefings, as well as access to all of our expert driven analysis. Membership is easy. Just go to thecypherbrief.com to find out how to join us. Now back to our conversation with former CIA acting director, John McLaughlin. John, there's going to be a lot to talk about uh, in these hearings. And, and I, I think there are going to be some new things perhaps that show up um, in much more prominent roles than they have in past worldwide threat reports, um, maybe climate, uh, maybe space. What do you think will show up that has not been um, over the last few years a priority in some of the, the threat reporting that we're seeing from the IC? Well, I, I think uh, there'll be some elements of continuity and some elements of new emphasis. And, and you've just mentioned some of them. I, I'm confident, I don't know this, but my, my view is that the director of national intelligence in particular, and probably the CIA director, will put heavy emphasis on climate change, mm -hmm. um, looking ahead on the pandemic issue, Intelligence is picking up responsibility for for these things. Yeah. On climate change, not stopping it so much as understanding the science and projecting where the dangers will be. And there's a lot of data on that. Yeah. Um, and so those two things will they've been mentioned before, but I think they will rise in 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 prominence and priority in the way these threats are laid out. Mm -hmm. Um, cyber will be, cyber security will be front and center also, given what we've learned about Russian interference in the 2020 election and the hack uh, that was carried out, Solar Winds hack. Cyber so, has been devastating to the intelligence community over the last few years, going all the way back to sort of the OPM hack where China accessed the classified information of, of I think, everyone who has um, classified access in the yeah, country. They have mine. They have yours, so, yeah. So uh, those things will be kind of up front, I think. Yeah. Now, if you go back to what Coates did in 2019, he talked about those in maybe a, a lower priority, but he talked about them. He didn't dismiss them at all, gave them prominence. But he also talked about what he called the big four, 
Mm -hmm. And the big four for him were Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. So I, I think you can assume that those will also be prominently laid out as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may put, uh, I would, if I were doing this, I would put a chapeau on all of this, saying that, you know, we are at a moment of transition in, in the world involving everything from disputes over what might be called global order, that yeah. is, who sets the rules to competition over technology, principally over emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and how we will integrate those into our national networks and into our t intelligence um, frameworks, our uh, methods, and, and that we're in a race with uh, particularly China on those, those issues. I would put some sort of a chapeau on it that said, because there's a danger in these hearings of just doing a kind of laundry list of problems around the world, hotspots, we used to call it. Yeah. When in fact, uh, we are truly in a, a you know, transitional phase in global politics right now. So it, that kind of chapeau may be there as well. I think that's a great point. You know, uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, General Mike Hayden, and I have many, but one of my favorites is that he often says that uh, the world has been more dangerous in the past, but it has never been more complicated. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, I was going to ask if you would agree with that. So when it comes to China, um, you know, he has also said, General Hayden has also said that China is the long game and that if the U.S. doesn't get China right, um, that that's it. Um, there are bumps in the night with terrorism, um, with some of the things that Russia is doing, um, maybe with Iran, with issues with North Korea, but that China is really the one thing that the intelligence community cannot afford to get wrong. John, I realize that you've been out of um, sort of the CIA for a number of years now, but you're still very close to this world. And, you know, I wonder if one of the issues is that the U.S. isn't understanding um, China because there's not sort of enough human intelligence coming out of China. That's been an issue that's that's been brought up in the past. What do you think about that? Does the US need to change the way it thinks about collecting on China? Is that an issue? Well, you know, I gave a keynote talk at a conference yesterday on open source material, open source intelligence. And, and a point I made was that an enormous amount of credible information is available in open sources these days. Yeah. yeah. Particularly about capabilities of countries like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Um, as an example, I used North Korea as a case, in, a case study. I don't know whether you noticed that the New York Times now has something called a visual investigations unit. I which, did not. Which used a combination of commercial imagery what I call unclassified SIGINT, that is systems that allow you to monitor the location of ships at sea, mm -hmm. which is space-based systems, um, documents, and my favorite, uh, uh, contracted cinematography. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Amazing. And they were able to document the illicit deliveries of oil to North Korea. Mm -hmm. in great detail and produced a video that covered this. Well, why do I tell you this? I'm just saying that when it comes to capabilities, the availability of information and, it's, and the way it circulates today is such that we're, we're pretty good on capabilities in the open source. Mm -hmm. Not perfect, of course, particularly on a country like China, but what I'm saying is it drives you toward the harder question of intentions. Mm. And it, it will drive the increasing availability and credibility of open source data from everything from researchers to scientific institutes uh, is going to, I think, drive the intelligence community to focus on the hardest things, which may be the kind of things you're talking about. What do the yeah. Chinese actually intend to do? What, what are their specific plans? Uh, how do they envision going from here to 2049 when they say they want to be, you know, the most powerful country on earth and so forth? And that's where the human comes in handy in understanding. Yeah, and I, I can't really talk about human on China. And 
couple of reasons. I, I don't do it anymore. I'm not there. Yeah. So yeah. I'm always hesitant to pretend that I know something I don't know, which is, I just don't. The thing that you talked about, though, just now, John, is really interesting. And, and that is sort of how open source and the use of open source by private companies or media organizations or yeah. others out there is changing the nature of the intelligence community. Do you see a change in how they uh, collect information, um, analyze information, report information in, let's say, the next 10 years because of this? Yes, I, I, I do. I, I think the pressures on them are going to be manifold, and, and that's a good thing because intelligence always has to evolve. I mean, <clears throat> up until the uh, invention of the telegraph in the in 19th century, mid 19th century, it was all about human, human intelligence and opening other people's mail. But once, once you had information moving electronically, then you had to come to grips with technology. And that has only accelerated over the, the, the decades. So that now, yes, over the next 10 years, I think the proliferation of open source information in a globalized world of communication will be such as to focus intelligence more narrowly on the toughest things that you cannot get that see, that countries are really trying to protect. Yeah. And also, it will um, provide intelligence with a lot of competition that it hasn't had up till now. Yeah, definitely. Um, because ultimately, intelligence has to add value <laughs> to what <clears throat> to what policymakers know or are learning from other sources. So today, I, I think we have in, in the White House and the administration, the first generation, one could dispute this, but my view, the first generation of policymakers who in their professional lives have been soaked, soaked in quality open source information. Yeah. You know, uh, the Trump administration, people had been out for eight years and m many of them were inexperienced. The Obama administration was the leading edge of this, mm -hmm. of this um, uh, policymaker world in which technology and the information revolution had, Im had had impact. After all, Obama was the first president to read his daily brief on an iPad. Yeah, I and remember that. That was, a, that was a, the beginning of this, but now we're at the point where you've got you know, people in government who haven't been haven't been away for more than four years, they've all kept up. Uh, they all do podcasts like this. Yeah. They all have been to conferences. They all write. They all live with open source information. And so, right at this moment, I think all these things are coming together for intelligence. It's a yeah. very interesting time. It is. I had a conversation recently um, in the Cypher Brief, and, and this is on the cypherbrief.com with um, Sir John Sawyers, who's, of course, a former yeah. head of MI6, talking about the impact that emerging technologies are having on um, good old classic espionage and how hard it is to spy, um, given the emergence of these new technologies um, from a human perspective. But I thought that yes, was fascinating. It's harder, harder to maintain clandestinity in a yeah. world where everyone's on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And if you're not, then you are also drawing attention to yourself. Got cameras with facial recognition now and all sorts of things that, you know, weren't sort of the classic uh, espionage game. So, well, and there's, there's a civil liberties dimension to this too. If you've noticed, civil liberties groups are already raising questions and concerns and alarms about the facial recognition techniques and video um, uh, technology that the FBI used to identify and arrest some of the January 6th um, insurrectionists. Yeah. So that's open source information. It's not available to just everyone, but it's not classified in the sense that the intelligence community uses that term. It's going to be very fascinating to see how um, the privacy and civil liberties and rights um, very valid arguments um, come up against, you know, what technology is delivering and what people are freely putting out there uh, about themselves and how that information is used. Because you're almost going to see a private sector that's more powerful than the U.S. government if some of these authorities aren't allowed. And, and yeah, yeah. If I could go back for a moment to the, yeah. the way you started that part of the conversation, quoting General Hayden about China. Yeah. Uh, I, I think an important point uh, that I would add to that kind of strategically is this. The United States has never faced anything like what it's currently facing with China in terms of competition. Yeah. 
pe people sometimes use the term new Cold War, but th that doesn't, that's wrong because the Cold War was a time when we were struggling against an adversary that was almost bound to lose. Mm -hmm. They had nuclear weapons and that was a concern, but their economy was steadily going down. And you can track this through the intelligence during that period of time and including the public statements. But uh, that was a country that was going to sink and it did. China's not in that category. China is, its economy has been growing slower than in the past. Uh, it is dynamic. It makes decisions quickly. Um, it is generally united politically. Uh, we see, you know, protests from time to time and so forth. But for the most part, the Chinese appear generally content with their governing style. And, and so, you know, when you look at historically, the Cold War was in no way comparable to what we're dealing with with China. If you go back before that, World War II, not comparable. I mean, World War II was uh, an upheaval that began, I was struck the other day that Hitler came to power in 1932, didn't really become aggressive until about 1938, and the World War II was over in 1945, which is what, 14, 16 years. Yeah, you know, four years less than we've been involved in Afghanistan. So we've never faced anything like this. That is a long haul competition with a rising power. We just haven't. Yeah. So we don't have a lot of practice at how to do this. Yeah. And uh, I think the uh, the primary thing, which I believe the Biden administration has figured out very quickly is that alliances are our force multiplier in this uh, competition. Mm -hmm. this, this can't be, shouldn't be, be foolish to be one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. because it's not that we couldn't prevail, but we have the ability to build values-based alliances. China does not really have the ability to build values-based alliances, but they are pretty good at building economically-based alliances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that, that so answer. that's, I wouldn't minimize their ability to cause people to adhere to their, their, their point of view and their, uh, their influence. Yeah, so it's a very different kind of competition. I think that's a very good point. John, um, just kind of wrapping up and then there's something fun I wanna talk about before you go, but um, we've covered a lot of territory. What will you be most watching for um, during these hearings? Uh, I think I think I would be most interested in what they have to say <laughs> on issues <laughs> about climate change and pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, because we've been focused on cyber for a long time. Um, I think every national secure, every worldwide threat testimony for the last five or six, maybe longer, has talked about. Uh, cyber. So I would say climate change and pandemic, which need more public prominence uh, with the vaccine. I think most people in the United States assume, well, that's over. Mm -hmm. May not be. Uh, there may be another wave of different, a different strain. Mm -hmm. um, we need to understand. And, and so as many doctors have pointed out, it, it ain't over till we have a global solution. If we get everyone in the United States vaccinated, but Brazil is still aflame with COVID, uh, we're, not over, we're not through it. So mm -hmm. that's the global dimension of pandemic. And on climate change, how specific can we be about the dangers of climate change in a convincing way? For some reason, there are a lot of people who still don't buy it. Yeah. Uh, no, the Defense Department will tell you that there are something like, I'm remembering 128 bases along shorelines that are in danger over the next several decades from climate change that will yes. go under. You know Kristen Wood. Um, I do. Kristen is also a Harvard fellow and a cipher brief expert, former CIA officer, and she is the co-editor of a new series on climate change. And she has a great piece in this week's cipher brief on how the Pentagon is looking at that threat and how they're training for the, yes. what about when all hell breaks loose scenario uh, when it comes to climate? Well, I think one of the things the intelligence people can do is to give 
uh, concreteness to this, to, to, mm -hmm. to paint it in a way that American public understands it mm -hmm. and, and finds it persuasive. Because I, I do, I, I don't think there's much argument to be had about this anymore. That will be very interesting to watch. Uh, also, um, what, what, what am I looking for? I'm looking mostly, I mean, you know, I, it isn't so much the issues. I'm, I'll be looking to see what is the quality of the dialogue between uh -huh. the Congress, the senator, this, this, this takes place in separate sessions in Senate and House, yeah. but let's, Senate is usually, usually first. What's the quality of the dialogue here? Can it be non-political? Can it be bipartisan? And, and looking, of course, for the candor that we need and expect from our intelligence people. I, I know most of these people testifying. Yeah. I expect them to be very candid and, uh, and upfront. I, Dan Coates was, and so was uh, uh, everyone else in that, in that hearing. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Gina Haspel and and uh, Christopher Ray, they were both very straightforward and very clear. And uh, Trump took them to uh, the woodshed about their candor, which yeah. you know a president shouldn't do, and I don't think Biden would. And so I, that I'm looking more for the quality of the dialogue than for yeah. the specific issues. To get us they'll, back they'll to get, kind of they'll, a focus. They'll do fine on the issues. Yeah. Um, John, I, I, before I let you go, um, and, and this is going to be a, a situation where people listening to this podcast are not going to get the most out of it unless they go on to YouTube <laughs> and check the video of this podcast that we're posting there. But you're a magician as well, a fantastic one. I know that because I have seen you perform magic in multiple different places. Um, I'm sure you did a lot of it when you were at the CIA, but <laughs> this is real magic. Just talk to me for one quick second about why you do this. And you had mentioned something to me earlier on about um, sort of the history of magic and why you're so fascinated by it. Tell me a little bit about it and then and let's see a little bit of it. Yeah, well, <laughs> we magicians always talk about how is it that the magic worm gets in your head? Somehow it does when you're a little kid and it never leaves for some people. and part of it is that real i mean good magic m most americans haven't seen a really good magician unless they've gone to you know las vegas and seen david copperfield or who you've performed with I, well i've i've not performed <laughs> with david copperfield but i've done a uh, a program with him on the history of magic so That's what cool. fascinates me about it is magic is um, really about the experience of life when a magician you know, takes a piece of rope and cuts it in half and puts it back together, it's because years ago in, in you know, the dark, dim mists of history, uh, people portraying themselves as magicians uh, could restore things that had been broken, relationships, um, bodily functions, and so forth. So ma the magic we see today is, um, a reflection of history over time. Uh, some of the magic I do uh, arguably was done in the uh, palaces of the pharaohs in Egypt, mm -hmm. certainly on the streets of um, the Middle Ages. Uh, there's a painting behind me on the wall, which is by Bruegel from, it's a reproduction of course, from uh, the, the mid 16th century of a trick that uh, we all still do um, with uh, cups and balls on a table. And you're joining us from your home office, of course, because of yeah. COVID. And you do have that picture on the wall. And just to describe for those who are just listening, you also have some fantastic books on national security issues. It looks like maybe some <laughs> on magic and, and some things that you use behind you for some of your magic tricks. Yeah, well, so we, we uh, there's a number of us who perform at the Arts Club of Washington in normal times, um, once a month, that's on I Street in Washington. And in these pandemic times, we've been doing an online show uh, about once a month. The next one is April 24. And, and where can people find out about that? Washington yes, Magic? If you go oh. to the website, which is www.washingtonmagic, that's one word, dot yeah. com. So www.washingtonmagic.com. It, it will tell you what we about our group. There's about five of us, and a couple of the people are full time professionals. Wow. The rest of us are enthusiasts. Uh, although, you know, we study, I study with a, a professional magician in Las Vegas. So 
I guess my answer to your question of why do you do this? Uh, you do it because it's fun. That's one thing. It makes people smile and and it's somehow tied up with uh, the mystery of human life. Uh, I have a trick I'm working on now in which uh, the entire universe, the entire material universe is represented in a single strand of white cotton rope, which uh, you will see at some point. Oh. But in the meantime, yes. you know, intelligence okay. needs money for their budget. So one way you can get it is simply to reach in the air and find it that way. And I'll show you something here you have to tell people what you just did. You just literally reached up into the air and made a coin appear out of nowhere in front Correct. of my face. That's right. That's right. Oh my gosh. Uh, again, magic tries to respond to the deepest uh, needs of human beings, which <laughs> often are material. I'll show you something here with two rubber bands. Now your viewers have to accept that these are just rubber bands. They are number 19 rubber bands purchased from Office Depot. And, and this little illusion is one that David Copperfield actually performed on television years ago. And he was very irritated by the fact that he does these gigantic illusions with, you know, making the Statue of Liberty disappear and walking through the Great Wall of China. And the only thing people talked about was this little illusion I'm about to show you with two rubber bands. Where and you have them over your, your index fingers and your thumbs right now in there. I, I have my hands locked together. Yeah. It, with a kind of, uh, you can see I have them over my index finger and my thumbs. They are interlinked, right? So yeah. in fact, you, you could say that these are, <laughs> I think David Copperfield said these, these are what might be called, uh, you can see I'm stuck together. Yes. These are what might be called crazy man's handcuffs crazy man's because they're just rubber, right? And you can see how they're linked together, right? Yes. Now watch carefully because you're gonna see them melt apart. Watch. Oh my gosh. Oh there my go. gosh. It, it, it looks like you just pulled one right through the other one. That's that what I did. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. Oh my so, God. Um, I think we can use that kind of magic in a complicated world, John. <laughs> well, uh, Very impressive. One, one way that it was helpful at CIA was to show people uh, magic and tell them in advance what I was going to do. And then if they were uh, mystified by it, to point out that it's a lot easier for an adversary to fool you if they're not telling you in advance what they're doing. Oh. If I can tell you in advance and still fool you. So imagine what you know, this information can do to you when you don't know it's being directed at you. Oh my gosh, that's that's such a great way to think about um, knowing what's coming and the whole mission of the intelligence community. I think so, you wrapped it up in a very so, magical way. Everyone go to www.washingtonmagic.com and when the pandemic's over, come and see us. It's $75 for a drinks, dinner, and a show. Best date night in Washington. And, yes. Uh, Looking for, I'm, I'm signing up now, April 24th. Thank you so much, uh, John McLaughlin. One of my absolute favorite people to talk to. I always learn something when we engage. Um, I really want to thank you for being with us on this. Me too, Susan. Podcast. You're a great questioner, a great interviewer. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone else for listening as well. If you're interested in more national security expert conversations like this one, be sure to sign up for the Cypher Brief's free daily newsletter at thecypherbrief.com. And be sure to like us and leave comments. We appreciate you being a part of the Cypher Brief community. Bye for now.